while uh, Matt's getting us set up, I'm Jason. This is Matt. Uh, thank Hi, you everyone. all for having us. Uh, we're really excited to talk about our work sort of as a collaborative discussion. We considered giving two separate 15 minute talks, um, but we currently have an exhibition in Buffalo that uh, is somewhat collaborative over the course of about 10 years. So we thought we would combine our talk. Uh, we may go over just slightly. Hopefully uh, we don't go over too much. Uh, so please bear with us. And um, one more uh, note also, the first image will have some flashing lights. So if you're sensitive to that, please avert your, your eyes for just a moment. So first context. Um, this is an image from my studio several years ago. Uh, and we started with this just to kind of illustrate the complex relationship that many have with home. Uh, the idea is that, you know, especially over the last few years, home is both comforting and isolating, as well it is, uh, as it is familiar and distancing. Nearly 10 years ago, Matt and I had a exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit uh, called Inhabitation. It was a three-person show with Osman Khan. And uh, I'll just read you the press release for context. Inhabitation aims to consider and reconsider the concept of domesticity, ubiquitous elements of the home, for instance, a table and chairs, a house plant or a simple beam, are altered or subverted by the complex ideas about faith, the current mortgage crisis, globalization, and even classic American representations of family fun. The sculptural works featured are both serious and playful. They engage through movement, flashing lights, and the spectacular, but ultimately lead us to question our existing biases and assumptions about what the idea of home really means. The event was a true uh, spectacle. I mean, it was an entertaining exhibition. Um, they really gave us free reign to kind of destroy the museum. It was great. Um, mm -hmm. Matt carved into the concrete floor. We had eye beams falling from the ceiling. Um, Man-made clouds were floating over people's heads that were shaped like houses. Um, it was really a, a true event. My contribution to that show um, was two large works. Um, they were sort of the hybridization of quiet, personal, and private spaces of the home with more sonorous, overwhelming spectacle of a county fair. Um, I wanted to create a new psychological space that was equally familiar and or, um, sorry, familiar and comforting, as well as foreboding, off-putting, and causing impulse for anxiety, flight, physical sickness, and even nausea. So this was a 25-foot um, hand-formed sign that combines the sort of ubiquitous uh, phrase, home sweet home, or home is where the heart is. You know, I grew up in a country home and we had these little wooden plaques everywhere um, that had these uplifting phrases. So I combined that. Um, first, I made it massive, 25 feet long. And then secondly, I combined it with a flashing rate that was irregular um, and quite uh, disorienting. So you would first, in my mind, feel the comfort or something familiar, and then pretty pretty rapidly feel like you wanted to flee the space. Um, the other large works that I did for that show was I actually built a 25 foot, uh, 25 by 16 foot dining room with a full hardwood floor um, elevated uh, about six inches using joists. And then from the floor, uh, there was a circle that was cut out and this dinette carnival ride was sort of elevated up out of the floor. And um, this was also coupled with uh, a soundtrack that had this cyclical music that was, again, a little bit daunting. It was quietly playing from within the ride. Uh, there, were, there was an iridescent layer of patterning over the already patterned wallpaper. So as the lights flashed, images would appear and disappear around you. Um, and again, it was, it was a, a truly psychological space that was for me familiar, but then also uh, quite uncanny. If you jump forward 10 years, uh, this is our current show in Buffalo. And um, we were curious about how the idea of revisiting the, the, the theme of home would change over 10 years. A lot has happened, especially in the last few years. So we've got a heightened sociopolitical tension. Um, we've got uh, an endemic COVID situation. Um, so we were working on our, our 
private practices separately for 10 years, staying in touch, but not really exhibiting together. And we thought it'd be interesting to see what happens when we both revisit home once again. Um, I think the result is solemn, um, quiet, no spectacle, much more contemplative. So the installations that I created for, um, I'm sorry, a decade ago were visually quite loud uh, in experiential spaces. What I did for the 404 Festival and then subsequently for our homing exhibition um, speaks of loss. They speak of an attempt to white knuckle something that is fleeting. So I'll read you a, a short excerpt from my uh, narrative for the 404 Festival. Artifact consists of a collection of small sculptures that capture the quiet, poetic moments in and around our home during lockdown in 2020. At the height of the pandemic and at the peak of uncertainty, I began noticing inadvertent sculptural compositions around our house, the authentic remnants of being, the residue of, an, of activity in an overtly and overly lived in space. This was unavoidable in our modest home, gently used towels lined along the bathroom wall, the honest tossing of a blanket on a chair, folded laundry on a wooden bench waiting for our children to put them away. These are all artifacts of existence. As the weeks went on, I paid closer attention to these subtle, fragmented, I'm sorry, subtle, often overlooks arrangements of objects in space. The process became meditative. The fragmented aesthetic is a dialogue with the photogrammetry process. I began to contemplate the relationship between focus, memory, and loss. The artifacts make manifest the liminal space between moments of activity. The scenes became an illusion of what had happened in the common rooms of our home, a projection of what may potentially occur in the near future. The reference in an incomplete memory. The truncated scans highlight the limitations of software and present a ruptured but somehow authentic documentation of the passage of time. Evidence of four players coexisting in a shared space for an extended and unknown period. No specified beginning, no projected end, limitless. I'm a big fan of the writing of Robrier, uh, the French new novelist or anti-novelist. And I think what I appreciate most about his work is his ability to embody all aspects of surround, all aspects surrounding an emotional human experience by writing analytically about everything but the actual experience itself. For example, he would spend pages describing the surface of a desk, the dust that has collected, uh, the rings left by a glass of wine, and every common object on the table surface in elaborate detail. His attention to the nuances of such a mundane scene elevates the power of something that often overlooks. Somehow there is an incredible feeling of tension present in an encounter that has no action, no players. The tension comes from what had potentially happened in the common space prior and what may occur in the near future. In a sense, I believe this is what I'm attempting to do with my artifacts collection. By embracing the aftermath of activity, the viewer is invited to project their own lives into the tiny vignettes. It is important that the collection reads as one project. Each of the sculptures are effective independently. However, when they're presented into collection, they form a gestalt which, where the feeling of familiarity, of comfort, of isolation, of loss, of quiet sadness makes itself known in the works. And then having the exhibition in Buffalo um, gave me the opportunity to think about scale. So obviously they're all scaled down. They're about six to 10 inches um, in size. And I thought it might be an interesting um, experiment to take one of the small vignettes and scale it back up to the actual size of the original scan. Um, so this piece is about five feet in diameter um, and is the actual size of the, the hats on the wall in our, in our room. I'm gonna finish with a very quick description of my most recent project. This is very, very fresh. I mean, like two weeks ago, finished and installed and haven't had a whole lot of time to reflect about it. Um, but it, it goes back to my manipulation of found objects. Um, I've been thinking a lot about value. And um, this piece called Receptacle is uh, taking a Rubbermaid trash can and combining it with a, um, a reliquary from the 10th century, uh, at least the imagery from the reliquary from the 10th, 10th century. Um, so bursts of reliquaries were designed to house a primary, secondary, or tertiary um, uh, relic of a saint that had either touched it, um, used it, or actually a, a part of that saint's body. 
Um, and the idea that it's something that is to protect and hold and display something of such high value somehow elevates the value of the container itself. So um, I thought maybe if I applied that to something that has um, a very different context, lower value, um, and is somewhat ubiquitous now would be an interesting object. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that work as is, but I'm happy to talk about more later. I'll switch over here with that. All right. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt, and it's really been a pleasure uh, to join you guys uh, uh, here at the um, Players Club. And thank you, Lance, and thank you, Gina, for including us. Um, so maybe kind of taking off from where Jason left off, uh, this idea of value and how to kind of visualize, question um, uh, how value is constructed. Um, maybe a nice transition to the next uh, piece. And this was uh, a piece called Cloud uh, that was exhibited at the Inhabitation Exhibition in MoCAD in Detroit some 10 years ago. And Cloud functions uh, as a mobile uh, cart, uh, like a kind of push cart that creates artificial clouds in the shape of houses. And what it does is it takes the local um, 10 years of a local rise and fall of a housing market and turns it into a 15 minute performance where the frequency and the scale of these um, cookie cutter houses um, are um, drawn directly from uh, the story of a local housing market. And it can operate in two different ways. Um, one is in the gallery where the housing, uh, the, the clouds sort of form a housing development on the ceiling of the gallery and over time, they lose their buoyancy and float back down to the ground, uh, ash-like with holes in them uh, that look a little bit like these sort of abandoned or, or derelict houses that have become too frequent um, an object in our landscape. And the other way it functions is on the street level, where I push it through neighborhoods and it um, creates these clouds that fly for miles. They go into the sky. People maybe look at them and, um, you know, we, we've heard some talks today about sort of projecting patterns, uh, humans projecting patterns into nature, um, and the cloud machine sort of operates in a similar level where maybe people are questioning whether or not uh, these patterns we're seeing in markets and in um, the sort of strange weather we're uh, experiencing, whether those are projections or something that actually exists in the world. And I like that, like the way that art, and that's something I really like about Jason's work as well, that can take a kind of familiar object and transform it, make it suddenly strange, and try to break that kind of habituation that we might experience in our everyday world, where uh, we slowly become accustomed to the strangeness that's all around us, like a, like a frog in a beaker that's slowly being heated up. So I want to introduce you to three different types of uh, paper uh, substrate here. Um, we've got a yellow legal tablet uh, that's used uh, by people of the uh, legal profession, often also politicians. Its yellow uh, color often is uh, attributed um, to like a sort of preemptive action to make the paper yellow uh, to get uh, sort of uh, uh, ahead of the curve of paper's natural tendency to yellow with age. In the middle, we have um, alternate rule paper, which is uh, this paper that many of us, well, how many of us used this sort of uh, paper to learn our writing? Okay, as kids? Okay, good. I don't know what kids do these days. And then the last piece of paper is logarithmic uh, graph paper. And so logarithmic graph paper maybe isn't as common, but it's incredibly important. It's used by engineers and scientists to graph um, uh, values uh, that have an exponential growth to them because we have a kind of cognitive weak spot in trying to um, understand and visualize patterns that grow exponentially because this shifts in scale. And so um, these are actually three of my artworks. Um, this first one is called um, Notepad. And all of the lines in the paper are actually microprinted text. And they contain details of individual Iraqi civilians that died as a result of the US invasion. Um, and so what I did in 2007 is I covertly distributed um, 100 of these notepads into the stationary supply of the US and coalition governments 
So it went under the noses of people in power who authorized the use of force, and many of them continue to authorize the use of force um, uh, in that area. And um, if someone in power writes on this paper, uh, or uh, their secretary or their assistant writes on this paper, at the end of the day or at the end of the administration, all these papers get collected and they get um, put hopefully into the archives, unless you're the previous uh, office holder of the presidency, right? Um, and then also uh, subsequently what I do is I distribute the paper for free. I mail it all over the world and I have some here today and I give it to people and encourage them to use the paper as stationary to write members of government um, and to lend their voice uh, uh, to the kind of a collective action to, to try to shut down the US involvement in foreign wars. The next project I'll talk about um, is called Log Rule. And over the last two and a half years of the COVID pandemic, um, as we know, more than a million people in the United States have died. Um, that's more than the total number of casualties in World War II, Vietnam, or the 1918 flu. And at a moment when people seem to want to forget the pandemic and move on with their daily lives, Log Rule offers a circulating memorial uh, to, this, uh, uh, to the scale of our loss in hope that those who have suffered and those who continue to grieve for loved ones uh, so that they understand that they're not forgotten. And this paper looks like the kind that's used to applaud, as I mentioned, the uh, exponentially increasing data, like the increase, uh, like COVID is an example of that. Um, in a log logarithmic plot like this one, each tick mark on the y-axis represents a tenfold increase over the previous one. And in log rule, the names, dates, and locations of those who've died are preserved uh, in the microprinted text lines themselves. And I offer this sheet, uh, sheets of this paper to anyone who would like to remember in hopes that the tragic scale of the losses we've faced from COVID might allow us to move forward uh, to a more equitable future. And speaking of uh, news cycles moving on and the need for continued action and protest, this is alternative rule. And an alternative rule, I, this again is a circulating memorial and protest tool, but this one's designed to commemorate the lives of children uh, that have been lost to school shootings. An alternative rule looks just like uh, the ruled uh, blue and red alternate line paper that we all used as children but in alternative rule, the lines of the paper are made up of thousands of microprinted names and details of individual children who've been victims of gun violence, as well as the date and location of each shooting. And microprinting is a technology uh, that's typically used for printing currency or copyright protecting legal documents. Um, and I think that's a technology sort of wasted on banks and governments. It should be used um, in a contestational way. So I spent the last two years inviting people to take sheets of this and use it as stationary to write members of government advocating for gun control in America. And each table has a, a small stack. And if you need more, let me know. I want these names to become part of the living archive of correspondence. So again, as long as the uh, letters on this paper are received in archive, the names of the victims will continue to demand the justice that they deserve. On May 14th, 10 black members of our community were killed by a white supremacist one and a half miles from my home in Buffalo. He was able to target the neighborhood because of a long history of structural racism and segregation in Buffalo. And only days after the shooting, um, another shooting took place in the small town of Yovalde, Texas. And so in response to these tragic shootings, I've been organizing letter writing events, um, using the paper to write letters demanding for long overdue changes to America's gun policies. And at a recent event in Buffalo, about half an hour into the event, there were three simultaneous shootings, a Walmart in Pittston, Pennsylvania, a high school in Los Angeles, California, and a mass shooting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where four people were killed. And I know there have been many calls to action as we continue to pressure politicians and people in power to take action to make schools and communities safer. And so I, al I offer alternate rule paper to anyone who would like to use it. And you, can, and you and your community can request sheets on my website as well. Yikes. There we go. 
There we go. Okay, so we're just gonna end on this last image. Um, so we're gonna end with a quote from, from a friend of ours. Um, actually, she's a brilliant poet, scholar, uh, and new translator of Camus' The Plague. Uh, Laura Maris came to our exhibition and afterwards we were having a casual conversation. And she said, you know, Matt's work seems to document that which has been destroyed, where Jason's work seems to capture what is worth saving. And uh, I feel like that's a great way to kind of conclude the talk. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.